Thank you very much, Gina. So I'm talking about um, traffic analysis for multi-car lift systems used as local crew. Um, here. And when I talk about uh, multi-car lift systems, I'm talking about um, roadless um, systems where multiple cars are sharing multiple shafts and the cars can change the shafts um, horizontally. Um, so um, it's obvious to use one shaft for the up direction and, and use the other shaft for the down direction. And in that case, it's a backpack solution. That means um, um, all the car guidance is in the back. And by rotating the car guidance, um, the, the orientation of movement can be changed while the car is held in an, an upright position. So when we have a look to uh, there are only two cars in, in a multi-car lift system loop. Um, this, this diagram shows um, the position of two cars over time. And we can see here um, both cars um, are stopping at the same time. And we have um, a time between the both cars. That means when the first car departs from the main entrance floor, it takes some time until the next car is available at the main entrance floor and will depart um, after loading the, um, the passengers. And there's a minimum time, the multi-car cycle time, um, between the cars. And so if this minimum possible cycle time um, happens, when all the cars have the same stops, there's no problem of distances between cars. And this cycle time, this multi-car cycle time, it can be compared with the interval. And so it's uh, relevant for the handling capacity of such a system. So, But what happens when not all cars are stopping at the same floors? So we are in using local groups, so all cars are stopping at the bottom floor and are stopping at the top floor because they want to exchange to the other shaft. But in between, um, all the cars will have individual stops because um, they transport different passengers with different destinations. And having a look to a simple example, again, um, the position over time of two cars. We have a leading car, the blue one here. Um, and depart from the main entrance floor, then the following car um, comes after the minimum possible cycle time. Um, and here, yeah, everything is okay, but the following car will catch up. And it's actually, um, yeah, where does it come from? It's at the leading car has two stops while the following car has only one stop and then it will catch up. That means um, either um, um, oh, um, they cannot be at the same place, so that means it will lead to a, a traffic jam or something like that. What is the solution? Um, yeah, an easy one is say, okay, increase that cycle time at the main entrance floor. That means the following car will show up later. And with that increased cycle time, we don't have that problem anymore. But as I said before, this uh, multi-car cycle time defines the handling capacity. That, that means I have a decreased handling capacity. Um, and the rule of thumb is that um, this additional cycle time um, is the time consuming when making a stop of the leading car. That's uh, just the rule of thumb, but it fits quite well. So when we have these uh, different individual stops, we can have, uh, we need to analyze two cars, the leading car and the following car, and both cars have um, um, passengers with um, individual destinations, and out of this destination, we come to stop sequences in the up direction shaft of both cars. When we compare these two stop sequences, 
we can find out how much the following car needs to be delayed that it doesn't catch up the leading car so that there's no traffic jam. And it's not simply counting the number of stops each car has. Um, it's a little bit more complicated because when, for example, the leading car has stops at um, floor two, three, and four, and the following a car wants to go to five, um, six, seven, and eight, it has more stops, but it will come to a traffic jam because the, the leading car has its stops at the lower part of the up direction shaft. But um, comparing them means that we find the number of stops that will affect the following car. There's another topic that will affect um, the freedom of movement of the following car. And this is um, the floor-to-floor -floor distance and the required distance between cars. So when, if the floor-to-floor -floor distance is long enough that two cars can stand at um, adjacent floors, then it's fine, but it's more likely that the floor-to-floor -floor distance is shorter than the required distance between cars. So, and in that case, the freedom of movement of the following car is um, limited because it can, I mean, it cannot stop at the floor below. There needs to be one floor in between. Uh, so we will see later um, with the results what um, the effect of this required distance is. So what can we do? Take um, a leading and a following car and compare the stop, st stop sequences and find out what is the required um, cycle time. We need that the following car doesn't catch up. And of course, the following the car will be the leading car if the next following the car will show up and we can do the same thing. We compare um, both stopping sequences and get again um, the required um, the multi car cycle time that the following car doesn't catch up, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, in that analysis, I, I try to make some simplifications. Um, I analyzed a pure incoming a traffic, that means a traffic mix with your 100, 0, 0, and I only um, analyzed the behavior in the up direction shaft. For simplification, I said, whenever a car is needed um, at the bottom floor, it's available. And the, and the goal is not to have any traffic jams during the movement from the bottom to the top floor so that um, a car it doesn't catch up. It means it shows up at the main entrance floor just later. Um, and for simplification, I said yeah, each intermediate stop has the same duration. Um, I know that's not really true, but it's more to get, a, um, and to get some principal results. And now I come to this, the Monte Carlo calculation, and I thank you, Lutfi, for your um, um, a good explanation. So I took um, a, a random passenger generator as input, um, as the floor population and the number of served floors um, above the main entrance floor. And in that case, I used the passenger generator of Elevate. Um, it's there, it's available, perfect. The next step, I take this list of passengers and when I know the number of passengers per car, I can take the first set of passengers and, and put them to the first car. I take the next set and put them to the um, second car. And then I have the chance to compare this, um, the, po the both stop sequences of uh, both cars. Um, but to compare the stop sequences of both cars, some additional information um, is necessary. Um, the distance between floors and the minimum distance between cars. And uh, yes, an input, what is the time when consuming a stop? That means the additional cycle time for each stop that causes um, 
um, a traffic jams. And when, and this is re and repeated multiple times, um, and the result is an average value. So, and now let's have a look to the result, and I want to focus um, only on the top line. It's eight passengers per car. We can see on the x-axis the number of served floors, and um, it shows the handling capacity. When we look to the first point here, it's two floors. It's the bottom and the top floor. That means it's a shuttle. Every car is stopping at the same floor. Um, that means there is no traffic jam. That's some kind of um, the reference value. When the number of served floors above the main, I mean, or um, the number of served floors um, increase, the number of different stops um, increases. We need to increase <coughs> the cycle time between the cars. That means um, it will reduce the handling capacity. And these results um, are generated with a floor to floor distance um, higher than the car to car distance. When the car to um, the floor to floor distance is reduced so that um, the upper end or the leading and the following car cannot stand next to each other, um, the result looks a little bit different and that's the blue line here. So that means that decreases the handling capacity. So why is this still the same value because um, with the floor to floor distance I made one exception between the main um, entrance floor and the floor above it's still um, the high floor to floor distance. So um, it's likely that not only one loop um, is operated um, alone I and mean, it's likely that you have two loops. And when you have two loops and every loop is serving the same number of floors and we have a random um, arrival of passengers and we have the same um, characteristic, but what is the option when we have multiple floors? We can have this kind of um, interleaved zoning, I think um, it's called in China's book. And what's the effect on it? When um, a group serves 20 floors and we have this interleaved zoning. The first step is that each loop is serving half the number of floors. And a second effect with the interleaved zoning, the distance between stops is now long enough that it's longer than the, re than the required distance between floors. So that means we come from that point and we go to ten, pa um, 10 floors, but we can move from the blue line to the orange line, and so the handling capacity can be increased. When, um, so, uh, when a zoning is done with um, the upper floors and the lower floors, we don't have the, um, the benefit to jump to the, to the orange line. So coming to the um, conclusion, when a, mu a circulating multi-car lift system is um, operated as a local group and um, compared to, um, to shuttle lifts, the handling capacity um, is lower. When we want to avoid traffic jams, the, the number of served floors and the required distance between um, um, cars affect handling capacity and the floor served assignment or the interleaved zoning um, improves handling capacity similar to traditional rope lifts. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>